That's an extra reading tonight. Because we didn't get to all this last week, but you probably remember we were talking about some of the details for rebuilding the temple. Yeah, we weren't here yeah. last week. Oh, you weren't here last week. That's right. No, last week was... Uh, oh, revival. Okay. The last time we were together, two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. This many cubits and that many cubits. Mm -hmm. And go down the aisle and... <laughs> so this is a terrible thing about wearing a mask with facial hair. All your mustache hairs go directly into your mouth. Ew. So, all right, looks like we are online. We've got some announcements. One is a new announcement. Um, Donna Bellinger gave us some info. The St. Ambrose Church is having a Christmas bazaar and soup sale this Saturday from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. They are selling soup by the quart. They are selling baked goods, and you can get a, a takeout platter that has egg rolls, pot stickers, and fried rice. They are also going to have handmade knitted items and handmade Christmas crafts, along with Christmas gift baskets. So if you are interested in any of those kind of items, head over to St. Ambrose Church on November 12th, that's this Saturday, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I did, I, put, I posted this on Facebook as well. Cody's on here with us. Hi, Cody. Now, a couple other announcements. Should I go in chronological order? I guess I should go in chronological order, right? Uh, this coming week, we are having our prayer crawl. So on Monday the 14th and Tuesday the 15th, we will not be having our regular men's and women's studies. On Tuesday the 15th, we're going to gather here at 7 p.m. and drive around and pray at homes. If you have a home you'd like to add to our list, you can let me know, but the better thing is to let Diane know, and uh, we'll drive around and pray. Um, that's next, wait a minute, excuse me, is that next week, pray? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, no men's group is coming. So no men's group on Monday, but we'll all be here on Tuesday at 7, and then we're going to drive around. Remember when you rode around with us? and we, Yeah. Yep. So before we did it for one whole month straight, but instead of doing it one month a year, we decided we're going to do it like about once a month. So, sorry, I'm getting a little warm here. We don't match anymore. Yeah. I'm going to go for a minute. I'm trying to remember. I think it was Sweetsboro Baptist. I think that's who it is. The thing that we have our food pantry, they're actually doing a turkey giveaway. Okay. So. I well, if you can find it, can yeah. you text me the info? Yeah, because um, she, if someone who came in to get blood work done, and she mentioned something, and we got talking about churches, and she said on the 19th, her church is doing a turkey giveaway. I was like, that's the same day we have our food pantry this month, so. We well, yeah, the Saturday before Thanksgiving is yeah. a popular day. Yeah. Right? Um, so um, she said that if, since they're only doing turkeys, she might send some people over this way since we have the rest of the meal. So okay. there's that, and I, I'm pretty sure she said it was Sweet Girl Baptist. I'll double check on that. But she, they're also doing registrations for them because they want to know if they have enough. I told them I passed that on to you, so I'll get the, some more specifics for you. Thank you. Uh, we've got Diane, and we've got Jill and Annika. So we've got Cody, Diane, Jill, and Annika all online with us. Okay, so let's keep going through our announcements. Um, Saturday the 19th. So not this coming Saturday, but the next Saturday. That is uh, our the Pennsville Community Food Pantry's Pantry Day here at our church. Um, we had a, an amazing donation come in today. The Sunday Breakfast Mission sent us 50 turkeys. So amen to that. Um, and there's some big ones in there too. I think uh, Vicki and the Isaacs can attest to the size of the turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Edgar. <laughs> yeah, and Edgar. That, so thank you to Edgar and Vicki and the Isaacs for all your work getting that unloaded. Um, so if you would like to donate food for, um, the, if you already bought a turkey, great, because we can use a few more. But the other kinds of fixings would also be good things to donate if anybody wanted to donate. Also, if you wanted to donate um, packs of hot dogs, or you can still donate chickens because we do have some families or some single individuals who don't want a 20 pound turkey. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to donate um, a chicken or even like chicken quarters or something like that, we can 
that will help us accommodate different kinds of needs. Um, also that Saturday, the Salem County Men for Christ and Salem County Women for Christ are having their breakfasts. Um, the men are at 8 a.m. at Penn's Grove Assembly of God, and the women are at 10 a.m. at CLC. All right, so that covers that. Uh, excuse me, where is, the Penn, where is the Penn's Grove Assembly of God? They're, they're the best. Georgetown Road. Oh, oh okay. right on Georgetown Road across from Corpus Christi. Oh, okay, yeah. Why is it called Penn's Grove? That's down at Corpus Point, isn't it? Well, it is Corny's Point, but Corny's it's Point within the donut of Pennsburg. It's the same post office, pretty oh. much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just point to the bus driver because he's <laughs> way better with directions than I am. Yeah. I think we all understand that directions are not my strength. I accept that. Mm. Carol is the speaker for the women. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. She's a great prayer. I love it when she prays. Okay, um, what else? On Wednesday the 23rd, that's the day before Thanksgiving, we are having a community Thanksgiving service here at our church. We're hosting it for several different churches in Pennsville. Um, Pastor Zach from Trinity is going to be delivering the message. And Pastor Mason might be playing the piano a little bit. We're trying to work that out. Um, but it's going to be here at our church at 7 p.m., we're asking if you would like to, if, or if you're able to bring a dessert to share. We're going to have like a little bit of fellowship afterwards. And also, we are not going to be taking an offering, but we're asking if you'd like to bring a donation to bring food for the pantry. So bring a non-perishable food item. Um, let's see. We'll talk about a couple Christmas things just to get them on your calendar. On Saturday, December 10th, um, St. Ambrose is holding a community Christmas dinner, and everyone is invited to that. I left my flyer out in the other room, but that's on uh, Saturday, December 10th at, at St. Ambrose, um, and you might recognize some of the uh, delicious pumpkin and banana bread that will show up there. But am I, I'm sorry, was that a secret? No. Yeah. Good, because it's not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that is hosted by um, Danielle Mason, Pastor Mason's wife. So we're very excited about that. So it's a free dinner. Free dinner. Everybody welcome. Go to St. Ambrose, eat food. Just bring an appetite. That's yep. all you bring do. an appetite, that's it. Um, yeah, they're just inviting anybody in the community who'd like to come out and have a meal to come and have a meal. So, yeah. I've never been there. Well, it's a good excuse, right? Yeah. I hear she's a very good cook. Oh, Jane's on with us. Hello, Jane. Um, so that's going to be on the 10th. And then the next Saturday after that, December 17th, that is our food pantry. And also that afternoon, we're going Christmas caroling. So Saturday, December 17th, we'll have pantry from 8 to 11.30. And then... Um, at 2, we're going to head out to Carol. We don't have an end time on that. It really is going to depend on weather. If the weather is really nice, like it's been this week, we'll go longer. If the weather is really cold and rainy and terrible and we're dropping like flies, we won't go as long. <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, it just it kind of go, we'll go as long as we can. We've gone after dark before, but we've had other years where it was like sleeting. And you just really can't do a whole lot of caroling when you're covered in ice. Yes? Do you have words for the song? We will. We will have song books. Um, we generally pick about a dozen Christmas carols, and we give out song books, and we try to rotate. We usually do about two or three songs at each house, and then we're also going to pray. Does anybody have a top hat by any chance? I do not have a top hat. But uh, I don't know. Be kind of old fashioned, you know. Uh, Jane, Diane, do you guys have a top hat? I don't know. I don't have a top hat. But if we find one, I would love to see you sing Christmas carols in a top hat. Right? Okay, yeah, it's uh, First Baptist Church of Swedesboro from 11 to 1 p.m. on November, 20, or November 19th. Sorry, I need, give me one second. So Swedesboro? Yep. Swedesboro First Baptist Church. 
Okay. The 19th between 11 and 1. Okay. And they uh, request that you just go to their website, which is just First Baptist of Sweetboro, and try to register so they have an idea of how many they need. All right, I'm going to say it again since I'm loud and next to the mic, just in case anybody didn't hear it. Uh, the Swedesboro First Baptist Church is giving out turkeys on November 19th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And they're asking for you to go onto their website and register online if you'd like to go. Okay. Um, if anybody online wants to find that link and throw it in the chat, that would be cool. Swedesboro First Baptist Church. Oh, Venus is on with us too. Hello, Venus. Man, everybody's coming out tonight. There's, there's Venus. All right. I don't have my uh, attendance helper here tonight. It's very sad. Um, last kind of announcement um, for our church. You know, each month we have a different kind of focus for a special offering, and they're usually related to missions. Um, last month we collected for African Nazarene University and we hit just under $700. So thank you for everybody who donated for that. Um, they are working to raise a million dollars this year to cover the shortfall um, so they can keep classes going next year. And then this month our church every year at, well we do it at Thanksgiving and Easter, but twice a year we take a special offering for what our church calls the World Evangelism Fund. So the World Evangelism Fund is basically the money that the Church of the Nazarene uses to send missionaries all around the world. And right now we are in a spot that unfortunately we have been in before. We have more missionaries and we have money to send them. So we will be taking a special offering the last Sunday of November here at church. Um, there were envelopes in the bulletins this past week, so if you'd like that, you can use that. If not, you can uh, just use your regular collection and write a note on there, and we'll get it. Oh, thank you, Jill. Even six, she's helping me. Jill threw the, uh, the link in there for the Sweetsburg turkeys. All right, I think that's all of my announcements. Any other announcements anybody can think of? I think we've announced everything possible. All right, I'm going to share our international prayer requests. And then we can get into our local stuff. So we have another country from Africa tonight that we're praying for. Um, we are praying for the country of Mozambique. Mozambique is in southern Africa on the east coast. Sorry, I got a picture in my head. They're in the southern part of Africa on the east coast. They're um, right across from Madagascar. So you know, the island of Madagascar, they're the edge of Africa that's right there by Madagascar. So, Mozambique is a southern African nation whose long Indian Ocean coastline is dotted with popular beaches like Tofo, as well as offshore marine parks. It has a population of approximately 3.2 million people, and the official language is Portuguese. The Church of the Nazarene began its work in Mozambique in 1922. Reverend Charles and Pearl Jenkins were the first Nazarene missionaries to be commissioned to Mozambique. Their task was to organize, supervise, expand, and develop the mission work in Mozambique. Reverend Jenkins was a visionary leader who invested time in training and equipping Mozambicans. Am I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, Mozambicans? Mozambicans, Mozambicans. I don't know how to say that word. I apologize. People um, from Mozambique. People from Mozambique. There we go. Um, the fruits of this ministry are evident as Mozambique is the country with the largest Nazarene membership in the Africa region and recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. So that's a good way to remember the church in Mozambique is the same age as our church. Amen. So they have 965 fully organized churches and 997 not yet fully organized churches across 34 districts. There are 217 district licensed and 226 ordained ministers. So 
So let's do our little math again, right? They are just under 2,000 churches, if you count organized and not yet fully organized. And only 443 pastors. Oh, boy. So they have almost four times as many churches, actually more than four times as many churches as they do pastors. So when we donate to places like Africa Nazarene University, that's why, right? They have a desperate need to train their leaders. There are currently two missionaries serving in Mozambique, and there are four missionaries from Mozambique that are serving in other world areas. Isn't that always awesome when you have missionaries going both ways? It's a good sign of a healthy church. All right, they have three prayer requests and three praises. They ask us to pray for the educational training of ministers as there is a lack of resources and infrastructure, like we just kind of talked about. Please pray for the church as they continue to recover from the loss of members due to COVID. Please pray that more Bible schools will be built to train the next generation of ministers. So if you're keeping track, last month we donated to Africa Nazarene University. Do you remember what we collected for before that? Rhymes with Nalabaster. Alabaster. Alabaster, good answer. To build buildings, to build schools, right? Yeah. So... This has been why, this, this desperate need is why we are um, making donations in these areas. Um, they have some praises they like to share. They praise God for 100 years of faithfulness to the Church of the Nazarene in Mozambique. They praise God for new churches and ministry training centers that are being built. And they praise God for the next generation of ministers who are faithfully answering the call. And they have a um, testimony here about their 100 year celebration, their centennial. Over the last few months, local churches in Mozambique have been celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Church of the Nazarene in that country. This all led up to the cent centennial celebration on the 28th and 29th of October 2022. So this just happened a few weeks ago. Almost 3,000 Nazarenes gathered in Thevain, Muchalane, Muchalane. Okay. for the joyful celebration. The first service on the 28th was a wonderful time of thanksgiving and sharing of testimonies. General Superintendent Dr. Philemon Chambo, who is a son of Mozambique, preached a powerful sermon that celebrated God's faithfulness to the church, even through difficult seasons that the country has experienced. After this, the retired ministers shared the history of the different phases of the Church of the Nazarene in Mozambique. The night ended with a concert that lasted until 2 a.m. It was an evening of singing, dancing, and giving God all the praise that he is due. The service on the 29th began with songs of praise. Dr. Paolo Suea, one of the key leaders in the early days of the Church of the Nazarene in Mozambique, said an opening prayer where he proclaimed, Ebenezer, until here, God has helped us. There were many leaders present, including the Vice Minister of Justice and Religious Affairs, and the Governor of Gaza, and the Mayor of Mandlakazi. Dr. Danny Gomi, Regional Director for Africa, stated, The words that I would use to describe the church in Mozambique are authenticity, passion, commitment, and sacrifice. The church in Mozambique is relevant. It is a church that is for every person church for every person. I can't think of a better way to describe a church. So it's wonderful to celebrate what's happening in Mozambique. Um, so in addition to those, do we have local prayer requests? Um, I have one. There was a fire up the street today on uh, Church Town Road. Yeah, so I guess it was like one well, three o'clock. You said like it started. Over. Yeah, so it's been going on most of the day. I don't have any news about injuries, so let's just pray that. I mean, we you can see the house is a total loss, but let's pray that there were no injuries. Um, let's pray for our friends over at Trinity. They're having some computer issues. Um, they had an issue with a malicious email that's causing them some trouble. 
So let's pray for them. And then David. Can oh, is that prayer answer? for uh, Toby? Mm hmm. And uh, a very good friend of our of our family, actually, it's uh, Janet's brother in law's mother passed away. Um, what is her name? The one who passed away? Patsy Smalling. Lovely Christian lady. S M O L L E Y? S M A L L E Y. Smalley. Okay. Smalley. Gotcha. Thank you. Just want to make sure I get it right. So we'll pray for the family of Patsy Smalley and for you guys too. Had a hard couple of years with friends. Hmm. Um, Jane asked us to keep praying for Danny and Dylan. She said, Dylan is coming home today. So that is wonderful news. Uh, Dylan is their grandson. Danny's their son. So. Um, in addition to little Toby, um, Diane has asked us to keep praying for little Liam down in Florida. He's a 10 year old boy. A few months ago, he had surgery and didn't come out of um, anesthesia properly and had lots of complications. He went home, he's now back in the hospital and they had to put in a trach so he could breathe. So he's a little guy, 10 years old. It's very scary. I mean, it's scary at any age, but especially when you're a kid. So, and we want to remember in the case of Toby and Liam, both cases, to please keep their parents in your prayers. Toby is waiting for a kidney transplant and is in the PICU. So, um, two little guys who've been in the hospital a long time and very difficult situations for parents. Um, Barbara asked us to pray for her, Barbara Dalbo. Um, she's still having some trouble with one of her eyes. She had surgery. She's had two surgeries this year on her eye, and there's still some concern that some of the numbers aren't quite what they would like. So she is praying that she would not need another surgery. Um, Venus asked us to pray for her job. She said they have an important meeting tomorrow for all the employees. Okay, they've been through a year there too. Thank you for sharing, Venus. So we did Danny and Dylan, we did Barbara, Toby, Liam. Um, we had a praise on Sunday night that I want to share again. Um, Pastor Tom said last week they had um, six kids over on the women and children's side who were saved. And they had an 18-year-old boy who was dropped off by a family member. And he also accepted Christ. And he... He had come in not really knowing anything about God or sin or anything. So we, uh, I know we talk about the mission a lot, but there aren't a lot of places around here where you can go if you really need help. And we're very grateful that the mission is a place where people can go. And yeah. I think a lot of you know that a lot of people from South Jersey get sent over there too because there just isn't much around here. And it, it's just amazing that the, a boy 18 years old, yeah. in this day and age, never heard anything about Jesus. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of harvest days. Yeah. So please keep praying for the mission. They've got a big event coming up. You know, they're, they're giving out their food baskets the Tuesday, the Monday and Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And um, they're expecting somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 families. Good. So, or no, 1,500 people, not families, sorry. Um, so, please pray for them. I mean, they're giving out the food baskets, but then they're also serving two hot meals. They have a lunchtime sitting and a dinner time sitting, or I guess afternoon and evening. It's Thanksgiving dinner, but you know. Yeah. So, they're expecting to cook turkey for well over 1,000 people for, that, for those meals. That's a lot of turkey. Yeah, yeah. 
Pastor Tom said they expect to go through at least 150 turkeys. So, yeah, so pray for the staff. They are going to be busy. Um, pray for Pastor Joe and for Mark and all of our friends over there trying to keep everything busy. And in the midst of it, they still took time to deliver turkeys over to us. So thank God for that. Um, I mentioned the fire. I mentioned the mission. Sorry, I'm just double checking my list. We have a few unspokens. One is for a person who's been dealing with some ongoing um, emotional issues. And uh, the enemy's really poking at him. And then we have a couple of families we're praying for who are going through difficult seasons, um, families with children. So we're asking for particular prayer for the children in those families. You need to pray for your family. I'm just going to add that in there. Um, Jill is just starting to come out of her COVID mess. Um, and Annika just tested positive tonight. So. Annika doesn't really have much by way of symptoms yet. We're praying that it doesn't get bad. Um, they have tomorrow and Friday off because of uh, teacher convention. So they've got a four day weekend anyway. So we're praying that she can just, we'll fill her with hot tea and keep her in bed. And the dog's going to have to take turns cuddling with the two of them. Don't forget the honey. honey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we will uh, just put Annika in your bed with Jill and Pepper, and you can take Annika's room. Honestly, I've been sleeping on the couch, so that would not be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. that <laughs> we'll make it the sick ward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put the, Red Cross the consumption the wing of the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll work. All right. Well, Jill's not yelling at me on here, so I guess it's okay to tease him a little bit. I'm not sure how accurate my test was because I. Your test was absolutely completely negative. Eric is on here with us. Hello, Eric. Good to see you, brother. That reminds me, we need to keep praying for Eric's neighbor, Wayne. Um, Wayne had been treated for cancer. He had surgery. He had to have a feeding tube, and the feeding tube got infected. So he was in the hospital for that, but he is back home. I had a nice conversation online with uh, Sarah Ruka. Good. And uh, we need to pray for her. She really wants to come back to church this week, so I'm hoping that she does. Can't tell her if she comes on Sunday night. There's, if she comes on Sunday night, she gets dinner, so. I've been she using... She hasn't been here since we started. I know. I've been using dinners to bribe everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think I didn't see any other prayer requests online, but for our online folk, I'll take a peek. I'll take a peek on here before we uh, before I finish up. Anything else in the room before we get to prayer? I got a, a, a praise. Sure. Of something that happened today. Uh, I'm out of bread, so I'm at Burger King. And I had to work this morning. I didn't have any bread, but I had peanut butter and jelly, but no bread. So this is this doesn't happen where they throw rolls away or whatever. But just so happened there was maybe eight rolls that were a little too stale to use. And I asked them if I could have them. They gave them to me. And uh, on the way to the table from the kitchen, I took the, the rolls to the table to set them to where I sit after I get done working out in the lobby, and on the way there, there was a song by Rick Astley called Together Forever, and I felt, wow, that, that's amazing, yeah. Amen. Me and God forever, together forever. So, Amen. Hook me up. Together as forever. Old, as he always does, every day he takes care of me. Amen. Well, that's a, that's a great thing to give thanks for. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Amen. I know a couple a couple weeks ago we um, were doing prayer requests for Gloria Hess. Yes. She was actually in for blood work this week, so she seemed okay besides what she needed blood work for. So you got you got to see her? Yeah. I actually tried to take blood from her, but it was she's a heart sick. So we had her laying yeah. down, and, but yeah, so she's 
just joking around, so the motion issues, I don't know what is actually what she's going for, but... Well, they were, a, she had a stroke a little while ago, and they were concerned that she was having more mini strokes, but okay. mm. when they've taken her in, when Steve has taken her in, it's usually that her blood sugar is really far off. Mm -hmm. But she that's causing some of the confusion and other issues, and so... Well, she's been telling that she was joking around with me as we were doing it. Amen. And talking about the church from back, you know, when I was a little kid and stuff like that, so... I, I don't know if anybody's seen her recently or not. She's probably mentioned it just in I case. haven't seen her in a while. Yeah. No, I haven't. Probably so mentioned it because she came in. Yeah, I'm glad you got to see her. I seen Janet. <laughs> Um, I don't think I've seen Janet since we visited her house to pray with her. Oh. Not face to face, no. Well, we'll pray for her too. Okay. As the Holy Spirit brings people to mind, we'll add them to our prayer list. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me of another one I forgot. Um, Daryl asked us to pray for his son Ryan. Is that the one you're going to share? All right, you go first and I'll go. I just want to remind everybody that even in spite of all the trials and tribulations that we go through in our lives on a daily basis, we're also blessed by God every single day of our lives. We not only have trials and tribulations, but we have many, many blessings that a lot of people don't even realize that they're being blessed. But I wake up in the morning, my first blessing is that I open my eyes. My second blessing is that I'm breathing God's breath. Yeah. And the blessings just keep going on and on and on all day long. One of, one of my favorite hymns is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And there's a, a verse in there that says, Morning by morning, new mercies I see. <coughs> well, I just want to every morning, you, yeah. I just want to remind everybody that, you know, I, I understand that there are trials and tribulations in this life, and there always will be. But a lot of people forget that God also showers blessings on us every day. His goodness and mercy pursues us all the days of our lives. We need to be sure and thank Him and count Him for our blessings and thank Him for our blessings. Amen. He not only helps, but He blesses. And that's important to remember. I started doing that a few years ago, and you probably picked up on it when you hear me pray, but I try, unless I'm praying for another person, I try to start every prayer with a thank you. And uh, now it's such a habit that I just automatically do it. When I prayed at the funeral on Saturday, I started with a thank you. You know, yeah. for me that hasn't been a big help because it keeps me it keeps me paying attention to God's blessings because they're there. If you look just a tiny bit, they're there. Well, we even have a little thing with our blessing that we say before each meal, and it might be unusual. Maybe a lot of people don't do this, but. At the end of our blessing, I also thank God for my wife and for Sasha, our dog, mm -hmm. because they're a big part of my life and they bring me so much joy. And God provided that for me. That didn't come all by itself. Amen. So in addition to the blessing for the food, I also thank the Lord for my wife and my pet, because as I said, they mean the world to me. She gave us the fifth degree when we got home. Oh yeah. She oh yeah, she she smelled pepper on my pants. Yeah. You come running around on me, and we aren't talking about the seasonings either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Venus said that she also starts her prayers with a thank you to the Lord. Amen. That's good. Amen. David does it a lot in the Psalms. Well, most of his Psalms of lament start with a thank you. Actually, it's an interesting thing if you look for it. Even when he has psalms where he's crying out to God. He usually mentions something in the beginning about his past and the time when God was there for him. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay, go ahead. Well, when I was over at my friend's house last week, you know, I was trying to talk him into coming to Bible study. And uh, I told him, I asked him if he prayed. He said, no. I said, well, she'd always pray. And I told him, thank God for everything. You know, always, always uh, give thanks for you know your meals. You know, yeah, another day of life. All you know, all the stuff that you get during the day comes with God. And then just be grateful for it. Yeah, thank you. The 
The last one I was going to add, um, Daryl's son Ryan um, hurt his eye last week. Um, he was removing a bolt and it broke and a piece hit him in the eye. So um, Charlene said that um, the swelling is going down and so, it, so because of the injury his eye filled with blood so he couldn't see. So they're waiting for the swelling to go down and the, and the blood to kind of dissipate to see if there's a permanent injury or not. So. We're praying for his pain and his healing right now, but Can especially you know the doctor? yes. But we are praying that there would be no permanent injury to his eye, no loss of vision. So, but yes, he did go to the doctor. I don't think you should do an MRI for that. <laughs> no, well, I don't. There's nothing still in his eye. It's just that it hit his eye. And, I'm saying that an MRI uses magnetism and that can yes, flip the metal you. out of his eye. And I hear you. Very bad. Okay. Anything else before we pray? We just keep coming up with more prayer requests, don't we? All right, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for another chance to gather. Thank you for friends that care for us and people who pray with us. Thank you that we get to be a part of this body doing life together. Um, Father, we are grateful. We are very grateful for all that you do for us and all you have done for us. Father, we thank you for the testimonies we heard from Mozambique today. Father, we pray for provision. We pray that they would have Bible schools and leaders. We pray that those leaders would be able to receive the training that they need. And um, we thank you for their 100th anniversary, for the generations of faithfulness, and for a worship service that went on till 2 in the morning. Um, it's a little bit of heaven there, Father, just worshiping through the night. Uh, so thank you for the testimonies we heard from Mozambique. And we pray, Father, that... You would continue to bless them and use them. We're thankful that they've received missionaries and sent missionaries. And just thank you for the give and the take and the love and the sharing and the calling. And just that we get to be a part of this process. I pray that they would continue to be a light in their corner of the world. Father, we lift up Danny and Dylan to you. We thank you that Dylan is going to be coming home. And we pray that you would care for them. We pray that you'd be with Danny as he's traveling for work and has to be away. We pray that Dylan would get the help that he needs and uh, that he would be well. We pray that he finds some peace, Father. We lift up Barbara to you, Father. We pray for her eye. We pray that um, it would be healed so that she would not need further surgery. Father, we lift up little Toby and little Liam Father, we pray for Toby to be able to eat and gain weight and grow. We pray for protection from infection. And Father, we pray that you would meet this need for his kidney transplant. We lift up little Liam, Father, on a, with a trach at 10 years old. We know that must be very scary for him. We pray that you would be with him to give him peace and that you would be with Toby and Liam's parents, Father as uh, they're watching their sons go through something very difficult. We thank you for the testimony that Pastor Tom shared from the mission. We thank you for the local church that donated um, all the fresh turkeys and fixins, and we thank you for the six kids who were saved and the 18-year-old young man who was saved. Father, thank you for all the work that you were doing at the mission. We are so grateful that we get to hear these testimonies every single week from Pastor Tom about what's going on there. And I pray that you would help us to support them, to join in prayer for them every single day, Father, and to support them in any way we can. We lift up Eric's neighbor, Wayne, Father. We thank you that he's doing better from his infection, and we pray for healing for him. Father, we lift up our neighbors up the street who experienced a house fire today. Uh, Father, we don't know what happened, but we are praying very hard that there was no loss of life or injury. And we thank you for our first responders, our firefighters and police and paramedics who were all there all day um, protecting the neighbors' homes and being there to help people who need it. Father, we're very grateful that we live in a place where we have access to this kind of help. We lift up our friends over at Trinity as they're having some technical issues, Father. We know that the enemy likes to stick his finger in things and cause trouble for us. And I pray that you would just help them to have patience and peace as they deal with this uh, 
flaming dart of Satan into their computer. Um, Father, we lift up the family of Patsy Smalley who passed. We pray that they would know your love and your comfort during their time of mourning. We continue to pray for um, Deborah Cawley's family, Father. We thank you for the celebration of her life that we had on Saturday, and thank you for the eulogy that her son Jamie wrote. We pray for Jamie now as he's returned home to Chicago, as he's away from his family. Father, we pray for comfort and care for him. We lift up the children of the two women who had the accident two weekends ago, Father. We lift up Joey and Zach and Corinne and Brooklyn as they've all lost their mothers. Father, we lift up Venus's work situation to you. We pray that you would be present in this meeting tomorrow and that you would continue to use Venus. Father, we thank you for the way you have grown her and poured out your spirit into her life. We thank you that you have used her to share scripture and support her co-workers. And we pray that she would be able to do that again tomorrow. We thank you for providing for Rob today, Father, and for putting a, a word of thanks in his heart. We thank you that Bethany got to see Gloria Hess this week, and we thank you that she's doing better, Father. We pray for Gloria and Steve, and we remember Janet as she's recovering from her broken fingers. Father, we lift up Daryl's son Ryan and his eye injury. We pray that you would bring healing and that there would be no lasting damage to that eye. We lift up Jill and Annika as they are dealing with illness tonight, Father. Please continue to care for them. And uh, just thank you for your blessings every day, Father. Thank you for the breath in our lungs, the life in our bodies, the people that we get to share our lives with, for meeting our needs and for allowing us to help others. Father, thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so we are back in Ezekiel. <clears throat> we are talking, we are in chapter 40. We spent most of our, not last week, the week before, because we weren't here. Thank you for correcting me. Um, our last lesson, we got through the first 37 verses. We've got a little bit more to read, and then we're going to... So we're, the plan for tonight is to finish chapter 40, and then we're going to take a little bit of a road trip. We're going to go back to 1 Kings, when Solomon's temple was first built, and then we're going to fast forward ahead to Ezra and Nehemiah, who are the people who actually helped follow the instructions that Ezekiel's writing down. So we're going to kind of do a before and an after of Ezekiel's vision. That's the plan anyway. Right? Um, so we are in Ezekiel chapter 40. We are going to start at verse 38. If somebody could read verses 38 to 43 for us. I can do it. Thank you. Uh, a door led from the entry room of one of the inner gateways into a side room. where the meat for sacrifices was washed. On each side of this entry room were two tables where the sacrificial animals were slaughtered for the burnt offering, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. Outside the entry room on each side of the stairs going up to the north entrance were two more tables. So there were eight tables in all, four inside and four outside where the sacrifices were cut up and prepared. There were also four tables of finished stone for preparation of the burnt offerings, each 31 and a half inches square and 21 inches high. On these tables were placed the butcher, butchering knives and other implements for slaughtering the sacrificial animals. There were hooks, each three inches long fastened all around the foyer walls. The sacrificial meat was laid on the tables. Thank you. Anything jump out at you there? I didn't know they did all of that before they sacrificed the animals. Yeah, yeah, so the animals would come in alive and they would be slaughtered and then butchered. And then depending on what kind of sacrifice it was, 
Sometimes the whole sacrifice was burned, and this the idea is that the smoke would be pleasing to God. Sometimes some of that meat was burned and some was given to the priests as their portion to eat. Sometimes um, an animal would be sacrificed and part or even the whole animal would be given back to the person who offered it and the family would eat it. So for instance, the Passover lamb, that's what, what happens with the Passover lamb. The, a family would sacrifice a lamb, but then they would eat that lamb as their Passover meal. Oh, okay. So there were different kinds of rules, but please. Was there a specific meaning behind the measurements of the tables? That's an excellent question. Um, I think the specific meaning is about them being symmetrical, about them being square. But isn't it interesting that this, the width and height of the tables, even the length of the hooks that are used to hold the meat are given here, right? right. That there is, I mean here, the, the section you started is about a gateway into a side room where the meat was washed, right? So like, they even had a specific room for washing everything, right? So I mean, it had to be clean before it moved on. Yeah, but that's, how, that's the level of detail we're getting here, right? Yeah. So we kind of talked about how, in some ways, it's almost like overkill detail, right? Like a ritualistic detail. Right. So there are questions about why do we have this much detail? Okay. And um, there are different kinds of levels. Sometimes those details have a strict symbolic meaning. Okay. So for instance, I was listening to a Bible study today um, where a Hebrew professor was teaching about Noah. And he was saying that um, the name Noah means rest. Um, and that also the, the amount of time that Noah spent from when they got on to the ark to when they got off circled the full year. And they went on to the ark and got off the ark both on, um, I'm going to mix it up, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, what, that starts off the new year. And so they spent a full calendar year so that they got on and got off on a feast day. And so those numbers of how long they spent on there, it adds up together to equal those feasts and the new year. So the first day of the first month is when they got off, or when the, when the ark hit land. I might be mixing it up a little bit. I think it's the first day of the first month when they hit land, but they didn't get out of the boat until the 27th day of the second month. I'm probably mixing up some of those numbers. Yeah. Okay. But, so sometimes it does. As far as the size of the tables, I wasn't able to find anything there. Well, I could understand the specific measurements of the temple walls and stuff like that, but I didn't understand the, uh, the idea behind the tables being specific measurements in height, width, and as you said, the hooks being three inches, you know, why weren't they five inches or why weren't they two inches? So let me tell you a story, and this is my theory, okay? So I was listening to podcasts. Uh, you guys know I like to listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. So this one was a, it's a podcast called 99% Invisible. They do like design and architecture and mechanical stuff, right? And they were talking about stages and lights and concerts. And they were talking about this story about Van Halen. You guys know Van Halen? Right? So back when uh, Diamond Dave was in there, when they were first getting really, really big, okay, um, they had a rider in uh, an extra paragraph in their contract that stated that in the dressing room there needs to be a bowl full of green M&Ms, mm -hmm. right? And everybody's like, oh, these rock stars are getting crazy and, you know, whatever. It, it, people thought it was a sign of decadence. Well, apparently somebody did some research into it, and that rider was actually put in by the lawyer. So he knew that if they walked into the dressing room and they saw the bowl full of green M&Ms, that somebody had read the whole contract. 
He also knew that if they walked in and there wasn't a bowl of green M&Ms, they weren't paying attention. Right? Because in that rider, it said that they would cancel the contract if the M&Ms weren't there. <laughs> so they had had this problem where they had, they had done a show, one show where they lost power because they didn't have enough electricity to the stage. And then they had another show where some of the lighting um, rigging collapsed because the frame of the, of the platform wasn't strong enough to hold it. And so they had all these details in there for safety, and they added this detail in so they knew if they read this, they probably read the whole thing. But if they didn't read this, they didn't read the whole thing. So back, you know, when Moses first received all the instruction for the tabernacle, the tent, you know, the, the mobile temple, um, Pastor Murky was doing a sermon on this years ago, and he got through all the details about how long the poles would be, and how many clasps you use, and how you dye the leather for the outside of the tent, and all these details. And the very last line is, and they did exactly as God had said. Right? And he talked about that, that little bit at the end, that God gave them all these details about what materials to use, and how to build it, and how many blossoms you would carve in the lampstand and they did exactly as God had said so I think a lot of this has to do with that idea Jim that God is giving them these details because he's trying to teach them to be obedient and there isn't like you know this this table uh, 31 and a half inches square right well what if our boards were only 31 inches or 31 and a quarter, right? We could shave a little bit off, right? God's not going to care. Mm -hmm. But the point is, God gave us these instructions. And he expects that they be followed. And if we're not going to be obedient to him in the small things, like the size of a table, then, well, then that creates disobedience in our heart and pride, and we're not going to listen to him in the big things. So... It's a little bit of a spoiler as we get into this other stuff, but I, th I think that's why this is here. Right? Yes, please. Uh, the NIV uh, Bible version of uh, verse 43 says, and a double pronged hook, each a hand bread long. What is it? Hand bread. Size of your hand. Oh, okay. Hand bread. So a cubit was supposed to be the length of your arm from your. Oh. I think your elbow to your fingertips. Mm -hmm. Just like we have a foot. Well, that's where the measurement of a foot came from. Or if you've ever had horses. They'll talk about a horse is so many hands high at the shoulder. So before they had reliable measuring instruments, they used their bodies. Yep. But remember how this all started? Chapter 40 started when Ezekiel sees the Son of Man, and he has two things with him. He has a measuring rod and a linen measuring cord, remember? So he's, he's checking, right? He's double checking that they're all the same. And he's checking that all this works, right? Because remember, this is a vision that Ezekiel is seeing. Ezekiel is seeing a vision of the rebuilt temple. In his day, in his time, the temple has been destroyed. There is no temple at that moment in history. But God is showing him a vision of the rebuilt temple. And they're checking everything to make sure it's all exactly right. It's the same way as, as like when um, I was raising my children. I would tell them, do this, then do this, then do this. And it's the same way with God. He's telling his children, do this, then this, then this. I guess it must be only really good parents who tell their children what to do, huh? <laughs> We were talking about carrying plates the other day. We were, we were talking about carrying plates full of food because, man, Josiah is like, he's like the evil Knievel of carrying food on a plate. And I was like, listen, you, you scare me? I said, just pretend that your plate is full of marble. Just always pretend your plate is covered in marbles. He just, I don't know how he keeps food on the plate. And you know what I said? I said, but I always drop all my marbles. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one more section. This last part is describing um, the inner courtyard. <clears throat> and um, 
the altar, where the altar is. Okay? Could somebody read verses 44 to 49? Hello. Thank you, Carol. <coughs> Inside the inner courtyard were two rooms, one beside the north gateway facing south, and the other beside the south gate facing north. And the man said to me, the room beside the north inner gate is for the priests who supervise the temple maintenance. The room beside the south inner gate is for the priests in charge of the altar. And the descendants of Zadok, mm -hmm. for they alone of all the Levites may approach the Lord to minister to him. To continue? Yes, please. The inner courtyard and temple. Then the man measured the inner courtyard, and it was a square, 175 feet wide and 175 feet across. The altar stood in the courtyard in front of the temple. Then he brought me to the entry room of the temple. He measured the walls on either side of the opening to the entry room, and they were eight and three quarter inches feet, inch, eight and three quarter feet thick. The entrance itself was 24 and a half feet wide, and the walls on each side of the entrance were an additional five and one quarter feet long. The entrance room was 35 feet wide and 21 feet deep. There were 10 steps leading up to it with a column on each side. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so any thoughts about this? Very specific. <laughs> Very specific. We've got another symmetrical space, right? A perfect square, which building a perfect square back then was a mark of, you know, kind of engineering prowess. Even, you know, the, the Great Pyramid at Giza, that was one of the things that it's a perfect square and it's aligned to the cardinal directions, you know. <coughs> what do you think about the size? How big is this inner courtyard? It's pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, 175 feet is big for your living room, but I mean, it's not that much bigger than this sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to stretch the width to match this dimension, that's about how big the this inner courtyard was. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the temple was not like. I mean, we have plenty of structures that are bigger than the temple. If you've ever been to a professional sporting event, you've been to a structure much bigger than the temple. Mm -hmm. So was this about size? No. There are some things that are different. So here's where we're going to get into some compare and contrast, okay? So we're going to start by going back to 1 Kings chapter 6, okay? 1 Kings chapter 6. So after the Samuels, but before the Chronicles. Now 1 Kings chapter 6 is kind of, well, it's a, it's a description of the temple, right? <clears throat> Not all of the complexes are exactly described the same. Um, some, if you look through these numbers, now we're not going to reread all these numbers because it's the same kind of thing, right? They're not all the same. Okay, I'm, I'll spare you the trouble of going back and forth. These numbers are not all the same. Right? All the numbers that are here describing Solomon's temple. Now, if you just start looking through, you might see a couple things that are different. There are some details that we see here that we don't see. Do you notice any details in 1 Kings 6 that we have not heard read in Ezekiel? Was specifying some materials. Yes, I'm glad you caught that, bud. 
Good job. What did he say? He said it specifies the materials. Oh, okay. Yeah. When in this description, there's a lot of stress put on what it's made out of. Which kinds of wood, which kinds of precious metal, right? This is going to be bronze, and this is going to be silver, and this is going to be gold, and this is going to be cedar, and this is going to be acacia wood, right? They're really specific about what materials each thing is made out of. Yeah, if you were going to... just read, just gave measurements. Exactly. So, why do you think Solomon's description would focus so much on the materials, but Ezekiel's vision, he's only focusing on the measurements? Solomon had all of those materials. Big one, yeah. King David collected for years and years. And so when Solomon came into power, his father had like 12 Home Depots worth of stuff sitting right there ready to go, right? They collected the precious metals and the wood and the cedars of Lebanon and, and the cut stone, and right? So David had spent years and years and years collecting the materials. So they had a lot of good materials. Now, a little bit of a spoiler, but when Ezra and Nehemiah go to rebuild the temple, they're not in exactly the same situation. I mean, they do have a little bit of a bank account to deal with, but they don't have like what Solomon had, not that well. Yeah. Um, I got a question. Yeah. I always think when you hear stairs and steps, I always think stairs are made out of wood and steps are made out of either stone or concrete. Or I don't know. They say stairs. The NIV says stairs. And, and so I'm always I'm thinking, you know, where they build out of wood because it doesn't specify. These, I'm pretty sure these would have been built out of stone. These would have been stone steps. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they're quite that technical in their description. Are they the same? Stairs the same? Um, I don't know. And well, then about it. It also says in uh, verse number seven, it says the stones used in the construction of the temple were finished at the quarry, so there was no sound of hammer, axe, or any other iron tool at the building site. Yeah, isn't that an interesting detail? Sol when they built Solomon's temple, they didn't use hammers at the site, so that it would be quiet where they were building the temple. They carved the stone far away. That would be like every time you had to use your circular saw to cut a piece of wood, you had to go to the neighbor's house to not disturb anybody. That would, it would add a lot of work, right? Now, we know for a fact that that's not how the new temple was rebuilt. They worked on site. They worked with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other, right? Yeah. Well, so, well, sorry to interrupt you. I mean, that's roller coasters are, like wooden roller coasters are fact they're built elsewhere and they ship them in. Yeah, but I they think do them on site. They I think, think computer-aided design helps us a little bit. You know, can you imagine trying to carve stones to fit together? You know, I don't know if you've ever seen a stonemason actually use stone to build with, but they'll usually have a rock hammer or a chisel. And when things don't fit quite right, they got to tap and make a couple changes and then get everything just right. They did all that off site and then moved it all in. They didn't have cranes, they didn't have trucks, they didn't have, they didn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. So you can see that when Solomon built that temple, they were flush. Right? They had tons of labor, they had tons of materials, and there was a lot of focus on how, I think you could use the word extravagant the temple was, right? Actually, th it's there's actually another good example of this in history. So, well, it's not like... Uh, it's, this is like the Solomon situation where they had a ton of materials. Basically, like when they were building like the Pyramid of Khufu and stuff like that, and they were using the rubber pulley systems, it took them like all over a hundred years to build it. Yeah. He Khufu was dead decades before, well, m more than just decades, almost a century before. It's a good point. These buildings took years to build. Sure. And sure. imagine, and this, like, at that point with almost no materials, this was basically just the t just that, but at a much smaller size. Because, like, we know where they essentially took gigantic slabs of stones out of mountains 
They couldn't do that. Yeah. So, very, very hard. Took very many years. Yeah. Now, if we want to fast forward, so I want to do a do our little picture of history, right? So where we're talking about Solomon building the temple, this is hundreds of years before Ezekiel's day. When Ezekiel is speaking, he is a prisoner of war in Babylon. When Babylon conquered Jerusalem, they destroyed that temple. Okay? The temple that Solomon built was almost completely destroyed. The ring of stones that was the foundation, that's the only thing that was left. Okay? N nothing standing above that. Now, some of that foundation is still visible. You're going to get to see it. The western wall, because the ground is a little bit unlevel. You know, some people have like a walkout basement. So the western wall, you can, you can walk up and touch those stones. The stones that Solomon was talking about having carved from away and brought in, you might get to touch them. I'm a little jealous. Um, but don't take any of them. Yeah, take a picture. Take a picture. I'm a little jealous. They'll have little paper head coverings for you, the men and the women. Mm -hmm. They give little paper yarmulkes to the men and little paper. Yeah, if you want to go touch it. They all. They also. Also, some people will actually like stick papers with prayer requests onto it inside the cracks mm -hmm. of the stone. That's true. Some people yeah, write down prayer requests and put them in the stone. No, I was wondering what, where that was and what that was. That is the western wall, the western foundation of Solomon's temple. So Ezra, in his sorry. Ezekiel, in his physical time, the temple's destroyed. He's seeing a vision of when it's rebuilt. If we jump ahead in the Bible to the writings of Ezra and Nehemiah, we're going to read of the construction of that. Um, in Ezra chapter 3, there is um, a description of the rebuilding of the temple, if you want to kind of check it out. But they had masons and carpenters, they brought in logs. Um, they paid the workers with food and wine and olive oil. Um, a lot of this material was purchased by the, the king who was currently in, in charge, Cyrus. Okay? So basically, the king knew Nehemiah, liked Nehemiah, and supported some of the Jewish people who had been serving in the court. This is after Nebuchadnezzar's dead. This is a couple of kings later, several kings later. And so they basically said, yeah, you can go build it and we'll sign the check for the materials. Okay? So they're rebuilding it and you can read all about that. You, I mean, I would encourage you to read all of Ezra. It's got some interesting stuff. Um, but chapter 3 is talking about the rebuilding. Chapter 6 is when Darius, he's the next guy, um, he approves the building. Um, he has to go back and look in the archives and be like, oh yeah, it was written that King Cyrus said that they should be able to rebuild it. And Darius was like, well, if it was written in the books, I guess we got to do it. So one king approved the starting of the project. People tried to cause trouble. The next king went back and looked and was like, oh yeah, look, the king wrote that we should do this. When did King Darius come on the scene? Before or after who? So... You had Nebuchadnezzar. He was the, first, the king of Babylon who conquered. Yeah. Then his son who came after him. That son is the one who sees the writing on the wall when um, they take out the, the ceremonial cups from the temple and he starts drinking out of them at a party and he sees a handwriting on the wall and they call Daniel in to interpret it. Daniel says, you're going to die and your temple is going to be destroyed. So that was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Is that your ball? The um, your bowels are going to fall out one or no? No, that's somebody else. Ah, but, good story. Um, <laughs> so then, after the guy who the ones who conquered that are the Medes, okay, and you have Cyrus is the first guy, and he is actually very kind to the Jewish people. Then you have Darius; he's also a Mede. Then the Persians take, take over, and you have Artaxerxes and Xerxes. That's when you get into the time of Esther. So where, where we are right here is after Nebuchadnezzar and his son are dead, but before Queen Esther. Okay. Make sense? Uh -huh. Okay. I try to use people as my timeline, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so chapter 6 is when they um, pray a prayer of dedication. 
um, if you want to read about that, it's beautiful. They, they dedicate, they bring everybody back on Passover. So that's a beautiful story. So it sounds like things are going right, doesn't it? You know, they've, they've done what God said. They planted gardens and they married and they thrived. People like Daniel, you know, they, they kept the food off. They prayed to God and God made a way for them to come back and rebuild it. They get back there and people are causing trouble. God protects them. God provides all the materials they need to build the temple. Because remember, they're all dirt broke. They're all slaves, basically. So um, God provides the materials, and they come back, and they work, and they build, they rebuild the walls, and they rebuild the temple. Yeah, it says the altar is supposed to be made out of pure gold. I don't think you can make an altar out of pure gold when you're dirt poor. You can't do anything when you're poor, brother. Um, it looks to me like it took them a long time to come around to God's word. It took generations. Well, we're talking almost 500 years yeah. from the time they left Egypt. From the time they left Egypt the first time? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why did it take so long? People are stupid. Because they were... All right, did you hear Bethany? I'm going to ask Bethany. you to say that again. Yeah, Once, did you hear People are stupid. She said, yeah. because people are stupid. This is where I'm going, and you're probably picking up on that. <laughs> God brings them back. They rebuild the temple. You think, like, man, they finally learned their lesson, right? The temple, I mean, they got the Holy Land, they didn't listen, it got destroyed, they left. They come back, God rebuilds it, and you think, we're not going to do that again. Guess what they do? They do that again. Let's jump to Ezra 10. Right? This isn't long after they prayed the dedication, right? I'm going to actually read chapter 10. It's about a confession of sin, okay? Honestly, Genesis 1 and Revelation 21 and 22. Yeah. Everything in the middle, bunch of idiots. That's us. Yes. Anyway, I'm, in, I'm reading from Ezra chapter 10 here. While Ezra prayed and made this confession, weeping and lying face down on the ground in front of the temple of God, a very large crowd of people from Israel, men, women, and children, gathered and wept bitterly with him. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehel, a descendant of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God, for we have married these pagan women of the land. But in spite of this, there is hope for Israel. Let us now make a covenant with our God to divorce our pagan wives and to send them away with their children. We will follow the advice given by you and by the others who respect the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law of God. Get up, for it is your duty to tell us how to proceed in setting things right. We are behind you, so be strong and take action. So Ezra stood up and demanded that the leaders of the priests and the Levites and all the people of Israel swear that they would do as Shechaniah had said. And they all swore a solemn oath. Then Ezra left the front of the temple of God and went to the room of Jehoanan, son of Eliashib, and he spent the night there without eating or drinking anything. He was still in mourning because of the unfaithfulness of the returned exiles. Then a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem that all the exiles should come to Jerusalem. Those who failed to come within three days would, if the leaders and elders so decided, forfeit all their property and be expelled from the assembly of exiles. So get back here and pray where you lose your land and you're kicked out. Okay? Within three days, all of the people of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. This took place on December 19th, and all the people were sitting in the square before the temple of God. They were trembling, both because of the seriousness of the matter and because it was raining. Then Ezra the priest stood and said to them, You have committed a terrible sin. By marrying pagan women, you have increased Israel's guilt. So now confess your sin to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do what he demands. Now there's more there, and it lists everybody who was guilty. But what's the big command they were given when they came into the promised land? Don't marry the people around you, right? Why is that? Because they were pagan. Yeah, they worshipped other gods, right? Yeah. And then, like, and then they said, like, Divorced your pagan wives, and then they did, 
And then they married more pagans. Well, so like, that's, we're not quite there yet, but yes, you're right. Because people are stupid, that's what you guess. I believe a wise sage once said that. You need that. to get together with Charlene and <laughs> do a puppet. <laughs> It's like, okay, divorce your pagan law. And you can say people are stupid and she'll say we're pagan. When you said the 19th, was you joking around because it's my birthday, her birthday going on? I'm not joking around. The NIV says the 20th day. <coughs> so the Jewish calendar is different than our calendar. Okay? The Jewish calendar is based on the cycles of the moon, and our calendar is based on a calendar year of the sun. <coughs> so I'm going to mess this up a little but bear with me basically all the Jewish months were based on a cycle of the moon which is 28 days Okay. so every year instead of having like you know how we have a leap on a leap year we add one extra day to our calendar every four years Every four years. Yeah. Right. they would have a leap month every year where basically they would go through the cycles of the moon but that doesn't equal out to a full year and then they would add an extra month in I think it was called Nissen but I might have that wrong so when they they talk about the 20th day of the month that doesn't exactly match up to our calendar so what scholars have done in the New Living Translation and in some other translations is instead of listing the Jewish month they'll list it in our calendar the same way that some will list cubits and some will list feet. So the Bible that I'm reading from converted that Jewish lunar calendar to our current calendar, just to give us an idea. Okay? Yeah. So basically, I want to talk about patterns for a minute. Saul, okay, so David great king of God, right? Why wasn't he allowed to build the temple? Do you know? He was a man of war with blood on his hands. He killed people. He committed murder. right? So God wasn't going to let him do it. So Solomon, he becomes king. And he has this moment where God says, I'll give you what do you want. What do you want? And you pray, I'll give it to you. What does Solomon ask for? Temple. It's not the he asked for wisdom. Solomon asked for wisdom to rule the people, right? And then he becomes king, and do you know the first thing he does when he's king? He marries somebody. Do you think no. he married a Jewish woman? No. Nope. Nope. He married the princess of Egypt. And Not only was. did he... No, this is after that. Now, oh. Sheba was David, yeah. Oh. Um, not only does he marry a woman who's not Jewish... He marries the princess of the country that oppressed his country. Right? What was her name? I don't know. I don't know. So he shot himself in the foot. Well, he did. A thousand times, Carol. If you add up his wives and his concubines, over a thousand. Oh my god. Right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> He was a tired Indian. Yeah. I don't know if the mic picks up your side commentary. But I'm gonna go back and listen and see. <coughs> but I can't help if, it if y'all can hear Bethany, just post it in the comments. He builds a temple. He immediately marries other women, and then do you know what he does once he marries all these other women? He starts worshiping their gods. Right. Now, they've been through all this mess. The northern kingdom conquered by Assyria. The southern kingdom conquered by Babylon. That's after all the civil war. They've had a couple more kings since then. They finally get the chance to come back and rebuild the temple. And what's the first thing they do? Jill says they can't hear you. All right, well, I'll tell you later. It's spicy. They marry other women, right? who were going to get them to worship other gods. When Ezekiel had the vision of the temple, when God took him in and they dug the hole and he peeked through the wall and saw inside, do you remember what he saw? The, the elders worshiping other gods. Exactly. He saw the, the leaders of, of Jerusalem worshiping other gods in the temple. Right. The paint isn't even dry, and they're doing it again. Right. Um, 
We don't have time to read it all tonight because we're actually we actually are running late right now because Jill's not here to tell me to stop. Can I get a comment? But can I get a comment? Uh, if it's pertinent to the discussion, yes. It's it's good, kind of supposed to be silly, yet also yeah, it's supposed to be silly. Ha ha! Heaven and hell don't exist. You go to the afterlife, or a weird hippo thing eats your heart. Okay, that's what the Egyptians believe. Yes. Okay, so. If you jump to Nehemiah, which I'm not going to read all this, but in Nehemiah chapter 13, Jill just said time's up. In Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 to 31, Nehemiah is there helping rebuild the wall, right? He has to go back to the capital for a little bit, and he comes back, and he finds that, well, what's the rule? I'm going to, is that, nobody here was raised as an Orthodox Jew, right? No. Okay, so let's see what you know. What's the rule about doing business on the Sabbath? You do no business. Don't, right? Don't. Well, guess what they were doing? doing they were leaving the city gates open and letting salespeople come in and do business on the Sabbath. Right? And so Nehemiah comes back in, and they got, a, they got like a full-blown mini-mall going on. Right? And he's like, what are you doing? Right? Not in the temple, but in the city. But it was on the Sabbath, the day they're supposed to rest and not do business. It seems like a Moses and the people situation. You go, you go away for a month in order to see what will happen, and you come back and the people are doing whatever they want. Well, the part where I'm trying to connect the dots here is, we might read, and, then, and chapter 41 has some more architectural details. We'll go through it quickly because we, we did the heavy lifting tonight of the reasoning behind it, but... We've got all these, you know, build the table this big and make the hook this long and, you know, all these details upon details upon details. Because God's telling these people it's important to listen. And they do that. They build the temple, the, they build the table the right size. And they make the hook the right length. And they, you know, they, they put the gate the right width and the walls the right thickness. But their hearts... Do they follow God? So, a little bit ago in Ezekiel, before this temple, God gave a promise to Ezekiel about something he was going to give the people. Do you remember what that promise was? A good shepherd. Right? The best temple in the world doesn't matter if the people don't worship. Right? Showing up in a building doesn't matter if your heart, yeah, yeah, look all around here, right? This, as good, as nice as our church is, and as much as I love worshiping on a Sunday morning, if we leave this place and don't worship God with our whole life, then what good is it? You know, hitting out of the parking lot at 50 miles an hour with Black Sabbath, throwing out your, your radio. I feel like Crazy Train does have a bit of a prophetic note, but on, on the whole, I'll agree with you. It was the only thing that was coming to my head. No, I know, Black Sabbath on the Sabbath. I'm yeah. with you, I'm with you. I wouldn't even go in there, it was just the first <coughs> heavy metal band that had popped into the head. Yeah. So, anyway, I read a quote from Charles Spurgeon this week, and he said, the holiness of a person nope. isn't measured by what they do on a Sunday, it's measured by what they do the rest of the week. And so I just, I want to say that, right? Like, I am so happy that we get to come here and study God's word. And you guys are learning so much and doing so great at this really hard stuff. But learning this doesn't matter if our lives don't follow it, you know? If we go out and don't live lives that honor God and follow God, all the Bible studies, all the churches, all the altar calls, they're not going to make a difference. It's like throwing a big fancy wedding and then cheating on your bride on your honeymoon. That's kind of what they did, right? Jesus is described as the groom and the church is his bride. And the goal, like Paul says, is for us to be presented pure and blameless before the groom on our wedding day. You know, so it matters, you know? The size of a table matters, right? 
Because what we do with our lives matters. The things God tells us, they matter. The way he tells us to live. You know, the Sermon on the Mount. Read, read it again. Read it. You know what? If you read the Sermon on the Mount every single week of your life, it would make a difference. Right? You've heard it said, you know, don't kill. I say even hating in your heart is committing murder. Right? You've heard it say don't commit adultery. I'll say if you, if adultery. I say if you commit lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery, right? That's the kind of stuff the Good Shepherd was trying to teach us. That the showy stuff on the outside doesn't matter if what's on the inside is wrong. So, this is just been... He sees it. He sees what's inside. He does. And it's been real heavy on my heart lately. It's been real heavy on my heart. Well, what you said to us a couple of weeks ago has really stuck with me. And I know that it's stuck with my husband, too. I am his here. I am his here. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That blew my mind when I read that. Because you read it in English and you think he's saying, I'm here. But in the Greek, it's I am is here. Mm-hmm. God, like you said, every morning, right? Every day. God is here. Yeah. So, we should that. act like it. I really love that. All right, let's close in prayer before my wife calls the police. Sorry about the money, Trent. She just posted, she said, I can still heckle you from home. <laughs> she must be getting better. She, yeah, she's, she's having fun teasing me. This is the longest she's been awake in a few days, so it's good. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for these words. Please help us to learn. Father, help us to see the destructive mistakes of the people before us and help us not to repeat them, Father. I know that we love you, and Father, help that to be consistent. I pray that you would sanctify our hearts and our minds, that you would make us completely yours, that you would help us to want what you want, to take joy in serving you and to find our purpose in loving each other. Father, help us to be what we were meant to be, Help us not to accept cheap substitutes for death and destruction, Father. Help us to choose you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's say good night, Jill. Good night, Venus. Good night, Annika. Good night, Eric. Good night, Jane. Good night, Cody. Good night, Diane. Hopefully, good night, uh, Nigel. Sadly, there is no cat stuff today. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. You don't wear your cat outfit today. That's a cat. All right. We'll have to put you in your inflatable cat suit. All right. Good night, everybody. Oh, I put this picture out here. This was donated by our lovely local artist, Carol. So we get to have, and it's, no, 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 no. We're just going to, we're not going to break it. We're going to admire it. Can I show the camera? It, it'll fall off. Okay. Um, they'll get plenty of chances to see it. And if you come to church, you'll see it up close. That one's plastic, Josiah. Okay. It's magnetic. Good night, everybody. Don't worry.